we were saying that in this chapter, we are discussing two levels of a gift, natural love that we were just born with. We have it innately inside because we have a soul and embedded in our soul is love of God. And the big discussion on that love was chapters 18 through 25. And now in chapter 44, we're going all the way back to something we like stop talking about in chapter 25. And we're revisiting it and saying, hey, you know what? There's more here. There's not just, which isn't a just, the love that motivates you to sacrifice everything for God, motivates you that you have such a fear of disconnection from God that we discussed in 18 through 25. There's other loves, even more powerful, even more precious. First part of the chapter, we discussed loving God because he's your life. And if you love life, you love God. And if you need life, you need God. And if you want life, you want God. And if you've had an experience where you feel weak, lack of life, then you understand what it means. This desire for life, that's a desire for God. That was the first part of the chapter. The second part, which we began last week, is loving God because he's your father. He's your parent. And the more you love your parent, your father, your mother, or both, the more natural it is to be able to transpose this and say, God is my ultimate parent. He's my father. He's my mother. He's my everything. And just as I love my parents, as I love my father, as I love my mother, I have that love for God. He's my father. He's my mother. And it's not just love, not that love is a just, but this is even more strong because this is saying that I will sacrifice for God because I will sacrifice for my parents. I will put aside my needs for their needs, as obviously we all know, we've all lived, we all have parents, we we know what this means. We will sacrifice our needs for our parents. And the Zohar that the Rebbe is quoting here says, not just going to sacrifice your physical needs, you will even sacrifice your spiritual needs for your parents. And that's true, We, we do, we will. So just as a child will sacrifice themselves physically and even spiritually, if necessary, for their parents, that's my sacrifice for God. So this love is even stronger than the first love we discussed because the first love was saying, well, you you love life, God is your life. So that's again, goes back to me, my life, this is good for me, my love for God, he's my life. This love is talking about, if need be, sacrificing my life. I would sacrifice my life for my parent. I would sacrifice my love for God. So it's not just how it works for me because God is so convenient and useful and beneficial and amazing for me. It's like, it's also when it doesn't work for me. I have a love for God that I'll put myself on the side for him. So that's the second, even stronger love that we're discussing in this chapter. That's also innate embedded in your soul. Now, where do we get this love from? So we know about it from a certain section of the Zohar we said called Raya Mehemna, Faithful Shepherd, which is a reference to Moses, to Moshe, who's the faithful shepherd of the Jewish people. And this was his love of God. And actually we said in chapter 10 of Tanya, when discussing the perfectly righteous, the perfectly holy, who we called Sadiqim, this is their love for God. This is literally how we describe their love with literally this exact same quotation from the Zohar. And now we're saying it's all of ours as well. How? Because we all have a piece of Moses inside of us. And if it's his love and we have a piece of him inside of us, it's our love as well. And then we said, wait a minute, because I had explained that the idea of an innate love is an inheritance from our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Avram, Isaac, Jacob. And now we're saying we have this love because of Moses. It was his love. He's inside of us. It's our love. So let's make up our mind. And we explained that the love, the power of the love comes from our forefathers, our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Ari, Isaac, Yaakov. But the fashioning of that energy, that it's a love like a child to a parent, that it's a love that one would self-sacrifice, like you sacrifice your parents, that's Moses's energy. That's his slant. That's how he served God. And he's fashioning that energy that that's how we serve God as well, potentially. So we said, hmm, 
I could really do this? I mean, we're talking about Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the greatest of the great, and me? We said, no, you really can. Because again, Moses is inside of you. This love is inside of you. You have a little bit of it. So what do I do with it? Well, what you want to do is bring it out. And that's what we were up to discussing, the idea of how do we bring this out? And there was saying something that I felt was really very relevant and very practical. There was saying, talk about it. As we use our mouth, our voice, our conscious thoughts, our actions, as we focus on something that fashions it, that molds it, that makes it happen. Like for example, in prayer, it says in prayer that the voice arouses the intent, kol ma'ayra kavana, which means a lot of us, when we pray, we sort of, now we know we're supposed to have our prayers be audible and we know if our lips are not moving, it doesn't even count. So you got to move your lips and your voice has to be heard. So we have, you know, like I'm moving my lips and my voice is heard like I'm, we're told, no, we can't say technically you're not praying. Your lips are moving. Your voice is sort of audible, but voice arouses intention. If you want your prayers to be impactful to you, say them loudly, say it loud, say it strong, say it proud. When you say your prayers loudly, that helps you focus. Now, obviously, if you're in a synagogue and there's a lot of people around and you're praying very loudly and it's annoying to other people, okay, you gotta figure out how to make that work. But if that's not the situation, the voice arouses intention. Now, obviously you could say, well, if I prayed out loud every word so loudly, it would probably take me a bit longer, which is true, it would, but it would be a far more meaningful prayer. But in general, what the Rebbe is saying, and we're in the middle of reading this, is we have a latent power inside of us. Every one of us. You're Jewish, you have a godly soul. You have a godly soul, this is embedded in the godly soul. We love God this way. We really love God like our life. We do. We really love God like our father. We really do. But we might be completely clueless and don't feel it at all. So the Rebbe says, so I'm giving you a practical way to feel it. Consciously think about it consciously talk about it, consciously do things with that perspective, and you'll see it will happen. The Rebbe is relying here on another concept that we've discussed before in Tanya, which in Hebrew we say, Hergel tevasheni, which means our habits create a second nature. We have the nature we're born with. Like maybe naturally we're impatient, but if we fake patience and we act patient and we talk in a patient fashion and we try to think patient thoughts and we act in a patient fashion and we talk in a patient fashion long enough, we'll actually become more patient. It's a really cool, amazing thing. We really can literally fashion our nature. It's like we think, well, if you love me, you'll take me as I am. And Tyra is saying, well, if you don't like something about yourself, change. You're not stuck. You can change. You can change. You can grow. You can liberate yourself. You can free yourself. You can become different. You have a temper. Love me with it. Change. You don't have to have a temper. You're self-centered. Change. Become other-centered. And the Rebbe's saying, when we consciously mold our thoughts in a certain way, when we consciously speak about certain topics or in a certain way, when we consciously do actions that express this desired target goal, a change happens on the inside. Obviously the modern psychology perspective is very much the in is gonna affect the out. And obviously there's truth to that. But what this is saying is there's also a very powerful truth that the out affects the in that how you're acting molds your inside, how you're speaking molds your inside, how you're thinking consciously molds your inside. So the Rebbe is saying, you have a potential to love God like your father absolutely selflessly. You sacrifice everything for your father, for your mother, you sacrifice everything for God. You're not feeling it, you're not in touch with yourself. That's normal, the Rebbe says, don't worry. 
Talk like you are, think like you are, act like you are, and it will draw the feeling out. And this is an amazing tool because it's very powerful for this specific concept and it's very powerful in general. Imagine, you don't like something about yourself? Change. Talk in a different fashion, think in a different fashion, act in a different fashion, and stick with it, be consistent, and watch the inner change happen. When we consciously talk, consciously speak, consciously think, there's a change. So let's read this inside. We are on the top of page 126, in the middle of chapter 44. We have already done about a page and a half of chapter 44. We're on the top line. The Hainu, meaning to say, Rios Ragil Alashoina the Koilo, that this should be frequent. This should be habituated in your voice, on your tongue, in your language. To arouse the intention of your heart and your mind. To delve with your mind. Consciously, you're thinking about God as the absolute source of life. Because he is my true father. He's the source of my life. If you're focusing on the words, you see that the Rebbe now is segueing both of the loves, right? In the beginning of the chapter, we say we have this natural love for God because he's my life. And then we discuss this natural love for God because he's my father, he's my mother, he's my parent. And now the Rebbe is saying, how do you feel it? Think about it. Talk about it. Act with it. And when the Rebbe is saying the vision of your thoughts, of your voice, of your actions, the Rebbe is bringing in both concepts. Because this tool, the voice, arouse intention, your inside is to be molded by your outside, is equally applicable for both of these loves. And therefore, you know, don't be stingy, be generous. Like, use it for both of them. So at the same time, think, God's my father, God's my life, God's my parent, God's my mother, God's my source, God's my energy, God's my life. I love God, I love life, I love God, I love life, I love God, I love God, I love life. I do anything for my father, I do anything for my mother, I do anything for God, he's my father. He's not... Like just make it all a challenge in your brain. Think about both consciously and talk about both and do actions that express both. And doing these things, both of these loves will emerge. When you're thinking and talking and acting, God's my life, God's my parent. This love is going to emerge, this love for God, as the love of a father to a child, to a parent, to a father. So you're going to start off and it's going to feel like this is not me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm just a regular 21st century American Jew who's trying, loving God as my life, as my father, as my mother, as my sacrificing all. But there's a stick with it. Just keep sticking with it. Keep talking like this. Keep consciously thinking like this. Keep acting like this. And it will happen. Hergel Nasateva. Your actions will create a new nature. Just as I said, this rule applies for any nature you'd like to change. You want to be patient? Act it. It will happen. You want to be respectful? You want to be loving? You want to be honest? Just, you know, pick from the smorgasbord of life what you would like to be, what you would like to shift, and shift it. And keep consistently at it. Don't give it up. Stay focused. How you're going to think, how you're going to speak, how you're going to act. This is so unnatural. This is not me. This is not me. Who am I faking? This is not me. Just keep doing it. And it'll become you. The person can say, well, but again, this is so fake. This, I don't love God like my father. I don't love God like my life. So I'm going to act as if, and we're talking about love. I mean, if you want to say patience, you can envision you act patient enough times, it sort of rubs off on you. But if I talk enough about loving God, I'm going to love him. 
if I talk enough about loving God like my father, I'm going to love him like my father? Like, doesn't seem exactly the same concept. So the Rebbe says, And even if a person thinks, this is fake, this isn't real, this is a fake out, I'm just pretending. I can say all I want. I love God like my father. I love God like my mother. I'll sacrifice for God like I sacrifice for my parents. I love God. He's my life. I love life. I love God. I could say all those words. I could consciously think all those words. But it's not real. If that's what you're worrying about, lo yachush. Don't worry about it. Because the truth is, this is true. You do love God like your parent. You do love God like your life. In other words, if you were trying to convince yourself of something, that's not real. That's not you. You could talk it and talk it and consciously think it and act it, and at the end of the day, it'll still be fake because it's not you. But this is you. This is your soul. Embedded in your soul is a love for God because he's your life. And you love life, you love God. Embedded in your soul is a love for God and a self-sacrifice for God, like for your father and mother, because he's your father and mother. So it's real. It's sort of like I'm thinking when you go on Mitzayim, if a person would go out in the streets to just sort of encounter someone and speak to them about Judaism, and sometimes very young people do this. So here you have kids, they're speaking to adults, they're saying words and the adult is like listening, absorbing and changing because of it. Like why? Because what they're saying resonates inside the other person. Because what they're saying innately, the other person they're talking to feels the truth in it because it's true inside of them as well. And that's why they're accepting their words. So the Rebbe is saying, It feels fake. It's like you've got your inside, your core. Now we're going to your surface. But guess what? The surface is really going to pull out the core. This relates to uh, uh, halacha, a legal verdict that the Rebbe quotes very often. The Rebbe really likes this verdict. Maimonides discusses this concept that if a person is in a situation where he needs to divorce his wife. His wife needs a divorce. And the rabbis say, yeah, you got to give her a divorce. And he's like, I don't want to. And a divorce can only be given willingly. The rabbis say, no, you got to give her a divorce. He's like, no, I'm not going to give her a divorce. Mm -mm. It has to come from me and I'm not doing it. So what do the rabbis do? They have him beaten. And he's beaten until he says, I want to give the divorce. And then the rabbis say, oh, beautiful. You want to give the divorce? Great. So it's like, what's going on? I mean, this again, this is like, this seems like a very, very not sincere uh, wanting to give this divorce. He doesn't want to give a divorce. He wants them to stop hitting him. No, this is Jewish law. The rabbi says this is really expressing the truth of a Jew. Because if the rabbis are saying that this man should give a divorce to his wife, that's God's verdict. That's the ultimate spiritual truth. That's what's supposed to happen. And therefore, this man does want to give the divorce. Because every one of us in our core want to do God's will. If the rabbis are saying he's supposed to give a divorce, that's God's will. That's what he wants to do. But he doesn't feel he wants it because he has got a lot of junk on the surface, not letting him hear the voice of his soul. So the hitting him is really to get past those extraneous voices. So he could hear hear what's really going on inside and say, yeah, I do want to give that to work. And in a slightly different fashion, the Rebbe is saying the same thing here. On the surface, it's fake. I don't love God this way. But inside of you, it's very real. So when you're saying the words, when you're walking the walk and talking the talk, it's really pulling out what's the absolute truth. And therefore, it's going to resonate inside as actually a very, very true and real love for God because it's absolutely true. You see the words the Rebbe uses. He doesn't just say true. He uses a double term for truth. To mean it's real deal, absolutely true. Mitzat atzmo, from itself. Because 
you have this love innately. It's embedded in your soul. It's your love for God. So a person could say, wait a minute. Now I'm going to ask you a different question. If I have this love automatically embedded in my soul, it's innate. I have it from birth. Thank you, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Thank you, Moses. This is me. What do I need to do all this for? Why am I walking and talking and thinking and doing all these things? This is me. I have this innately. What do I need to bother with any of this, you know, surface fake stuff to pull out what's real? It is real. I have it inside of me. What do I need any of this other stuff for? So the Rebbe says, Rock only. To benefit, to help. That this love that you do have and is buried inside of you for real should come out, should shine. That the truth of this love should be experienced. We don't want a love to be in a vacuum. If you think of the quintessal verse that all of Tanya is based on, the matter is very near you, in your mouth, and in your heart and with your loves, la a so so, to do it, bilvavcha, in your heart, la a so so, to be expressed in the realm of action of Torah and the commandments, Torah and mitzvah serving God. A love in a vacuum is not a love. It doesn't have anything of substance of import. If the love is real. It's bilvavcha l'asoso. The love is going to be expressed naturally in the fulfillment of action of Torah and mitzvahs. Meaning if someone says, I love God, I love God so much. So what are you doing for him? Oh, I don't, I don't know, I'm doing for him. What do I need to do for him? I love it. I'm a Jew. I love God. No, I'm not knocking a Jew that says they're Jew and they love God, obviously. But if the love is real, there's a need to express it. Just if you can envision in a human relationship, if you love someone, you feel a need to express that love. It, it might not be in a financial fashion, but in some fashion, by a gesture, by a word, in some way, you're going to express your love. That's what love requires. The very word for love in Hebrew, ahava, which is how you say love in Hebrew, the root word of ahava is hav which means to give. The nature of love is to give to the one you love. So, you know, there's all this unrequited love concept, but if it's a real love, you need to express it. You express it in a giving to the one you love. So if you really love God, it has to be expressed in action. So the Rebbe is saying, yes, you have this enormous love inside of you. So why are we fashioning your mind and your voice and your actions to express it? Because if the love is buried inside your soul, it's not in its real state. It's in a latent state. It's in a potential state. It's true, but it's still potential. To actualize that potential, you're going to do something with this love. And if it's a love for God, what you're going to do is serve him. And every time you serve, you study Torah, you do a commandment, that's how you express this love. Has anyone here gone through that when they've really seen it in themselves, that movement of like, if I really feel I love God, I should do something about it. If I really feel I love God, I want to give him something. If I really feel I love God, I want to serve him. I said this explains that if you really love God, you're going to do for two reasons. One is because if you love someone, you want to give to them. And if we love God and we want to give to God, we give to God our service, Torah and the commandments. And also, if you really love someone, you want to be with them. How can I, a finite creation, be with the infinity of God in the roads he allows? When I study his Torah, God and I are one. When I do his commandments, God and I are one. So if I love God, I want to give to him. That's my service of Torah mitzvahs. If I love God, I want to be with him. That's through Torah mitzvahs. 
So if you have all this love of God and it's not expressing itself in Torah mitzvahs, something is off. And that's why the Rebbe is saying, why do you need to consciously think and consciously speak and consciously act? Because you have this buried love, but for that buried love to be expressed in action, this is what you have to do to open it up, to pull it out. And if you don't express it in action, what's going on here with this love? So has anyone experienced this inside themselves that they had this, like almost like this epiphany awareness of like, well, if I really love God, what am I doing about it? Or if I really love God, how do I give to him? Or if I really love God, how do I become one with him? And from there, move to the idea of serving God? I think it's a, a human experience. I mean, maybe not anyone in the group, or maybe um, you're not remembering, or maybe it's you know, easy to share. But I, I do think it's an experience we go through at times. Maybe it's not as articulated as I'm saying it, but I really do think that's our movement. That impetus of, I love you, God, so I want to serve you. I want to give to you. I want to be with you. It's sort of a natural morphing inside of us as we graduate from enjoying the feeling of loving God to the sense of feeling a desire to give to God and feeling a desire to be with God that translates into Torah and the commandments. So can I just say, sure. Um, could it also be um, done through p more passive, like making choices? What do you mean, Sarah? I mean, um, well, just the choices in the direction one decides to, to go or to, take on something or not to do something else for sure yeah obviously if you're if your love is motivating you you're gonna say hmm i should spend more time this or spend more time this and then you make the choice that would be more a god oriented choice you might not be unpacking it in your brain as like i love you god and therefore i am choosing to spend more time in your direction but that's what's happening and that's why sometimes it's I hope so. see it in like hindsight, meaning maybe when you're going through it, you're not like consciously hearing the dialogue in your brain. Well, if I'd love God, I would do this. Well, I love you, God, so I'm going to do this. But maybe when you look back at your choices and you're like, well, what motivated me to go in that direction, not that direction? Yeah, it was my love for God. And maybe, maybe also the whole Yiddish kite package. <laughs> it sounds funny, but. No, for, for sure. Not funny at all. Absolutely. 100%. And that's why I'm saying, I, I did feel it was a question that a lot of people could have a, a could, could share if they're thinking about I'm it, listening. because we do have these experiences. But again, maybe we don't label them in our head, like, like maybe that term love of God, it seems like, ooh, that sounds really intense. Do I really, can I really talk about my love of God? But it's true, we do. We really do love Hashem a lot. And we really do make a lot of choices because of our love of Hashem, even though maybe we're not so comfortable to express it that way. But absolutely, 100%, for sure. No question. And what the Rebbe is saying here is, every Jew has this. Every Jew has this enormous love of God. And as we focus on it, and we think about it, and we talk about it, it really comes out. That's the nature of the Jew. A Jew is a lover of God. So the benefit of, of pulling it out to be revealed, if I have it already in my heart, what do I need to do all this work for? No, because you don't want it to be buried in your heart. You want it to be revealed. Because I want this love to be actualized as we just spent a long time discussing that if you have the love, but it's not leading to an action, it's sort of a question on that love. What do I mean actualize? What's the action of love? The action of love, if it's love of God, is Torah mitzvahs. Maybe the action of love for your mother is cleaning the kitchen or taking out the garbage. The action of love for your spouse might be making a nice supper. Well, the action of love for God is Torah mitzvahs. Shalom, that he's learning the Torah, and he's fulfilling the mitzvahs, through this love. How do I 
define this in myself, meaning like Sarah was saying, I might not label it love. So the Rebbe says, this might be what you're thinking. Maybe you're not thinking, I love God. Maybe you're thinking, I want to give God nachas. I want to give God pleasure. I want to give God joy. Kiven ha'oved is aviv. Like a child's relationship to his parent, like a son to his father, like a child to his parent. When you're thinking, I want to make my mother proud of me. I want to make my father happy. So again, depending on the parent and the child and the relationship, it might be making a supper, picking up something in the store, bringing home a good grade from school. But I want to make my mother proud. I want to make my father have nachas, which means I have all this love for my parents and this is how I'm expressing it. So again, maybe the child isn't thinking in the terminology love. They might be thinking in the terminology nachas. But what's motivating you to want to give your parent nachas? Your love. And when we're adults and our parents are adults, uh, the examples might be different, but the feeling is the same. I want my parent to be happy, so I'm going to call them regularly. I want uh, my mother to have nachas. I'll send her pictures of the kids. I want and, you know, my father to have nachas. I'll share with him my accomplishments, whatever it is, because I love them. And I want to give to them, and I want to give them joy, nachas. So by buying this item or sharing this concept or telling this story, this vignette, I want to give them nachas because I love them. So the Rebbe is saying that could be how you're thinking about it toward God as well. I want to do the mitzvah. I want to learn his Torah. I want to do the mitzvah more beautifully. I want to inspire other people to do the mitzvah. I want to give God nachas. Why? Because I love him. And that thought is a very, very real expression of a very, very, very deep part of yourself. And therefore, what the Rebbe is saying is, it's not so difficult to access. It really, that might sound like, oh my gosh, this is so high, this is so holy, this is 21st century America, what are we doing this for? But they were saying, but this is you. This is you. This is your nature. You're a Jew, your nature is to love God. Your nature is to want to give to God. Your nature is to want to give him nachas. Your nature is to want to be with him. Your nature is to want to do Torah mitzvahs if you have the education to know that that's how these things are accomplished. And if you don't feel any of this, the Rebbe is saying, no problem. Talk about it. Talk to yourself about it. Talk to other people about it. Consciously think about it. Consciously talk about it. Consciously do acts that would express it. If I really was feeling this love, this is how I would serve God. Do it like that and keep doing it like that and watch the feeling emerge. How do we know the feeling is going to emerge? Because you have this feeling, because you're a Jew. It's a very, very beautiful vision of ourselves and of every other Jew. Every Jew really, really loves God. And the Rebbe is saying, just put yourself in the right situation. Think those thoughts, do those actions, and that love will come out. Because if you're a Jew, it's just embedded in your soul. So we have a lot of power inside, far more power than we might credit ourselves with, far more spirituality than we might credit ourselves with. And it's not, well, yeah, I'm more spiritual. No, the Rebbe is saying, every Jew is more spiritual. This is the nature of the Jew. And based on this, it says, So this is a saying of our sages. It's actually a saying we've discussed earlier in Tanya in a different aspect, but sort of a very similar point. So the saying of our sages is, a good thought God joins to a deed. And as it's explained spiritually, that's what it says in the Talmud. As Rebbe explains, according to Hasidus, what's this joining? Leos gadfin lefarcha kanal. To be wings that they should fly, as we've discussed above. So what is this talking about? What, are, what is this talking about in the Talmud? What is this talking about in Tanya? And what is it talking about here? So 
there is a concept in the Talmud of a person who really meant to do a good deed, but it didn't happen. You, uh, you know, went to visit the sick and they wouldn't let you in the hospital. You went to visit the sick and he wasn't home or didn't answer the door. You slept really far to give someone shalchmanas to blow them shayfar and Rosh Hashanah. You made such a huge effort and nobody was home. I actually had this Pesach. I walked with uh, my son and my husband quite far on a tahalucha on the last Shvishal Pesach by night. And of course, it's the holiday, so we can't call before, or send a text that we're coming. And it was a long walk. And the person didn't answer the door. So we, and we had a long walk back. So these things happen in life. And of course, you can be disappointed. I said to myself, this is so beautiful. We're going to Akron Shal Pesach, doing the Rebbe Shlichas. Okay, nobody answered the door, but hey, this is Springfield, Illinois. Who, who can see my husband and son walking on the streets of Springfield? Who knows what's happening? Whatever, you say things to make yourself feel okay. So the Talmud says, God views your action, your intention, your desired action as if it really happened. Now, this doesn't mean if you're sitting home and say, oh, it'd be such a beautiful idea to visit my, my neighbor who's not feeling well. And then you're like, ah, eh, she probably isn't interested in visitors. No, that's not what it means. Oh, I'd love to go visit so-and-so. Oh, I don't have time. I don't know if she'd want visitors. That's not what it means. It means like, <laughs> like when, when we went and walked that walk and the person didn't answer the door which of course happens in many other scenarios in life where you really expend a lot of effort and didn't work out. The Talmud says, fear not. God's giving credit to your account. God's counting it like if you did it. So that's, that's the law. The Alta Rebbe discusses this earlier in Tanya and he says, you know, the wording's a little off because if that's what our sages are trying to say, they should have said something like, God views your good intention like a deed. God considers your good intention like a deed. But that's not what they wrote. They wrote a good thought, your good intention, your good desires. God joins to the deed. We're like, what do you mean joins to the deed? There was no deed to join it to. That's the problem. So and we understand their point, but why do they say it that way? So the author Rebbe says, they say it that way to leave room for another version of the story, not negating the generally accepted understanding of this, which is, if you try really hard and it doesn't happen, God credits it as if it did. That's true. It's 100% true. But there's other levels of meaning as well. So the author Rebbe says, earlier in Tanya, in chapter 16, if a person has a good thought, a good thought of loving God, but it's a thought, it's not in their heart, it's in their mind. The technical term for that is called tvuna. It's a intellectualized love for God. It didn't penetrate your in a revealed way in your heart. And then they do the commandment. So we have this good thought and we do have a commandment. It was done. But the problem is there's a separation between my good thought and the commandment. And God will do me a favor and join the two together. Now, what do I mean the separation? Let me unpack this a little more. When we love God, as I've been saying now at length, we want to give to him. We want to serve him. We want to be one with him. And therefore we study the Torah or do the commandment. So let's say with all this feeling for God, you're giving charity. Or with all this feeling for God, you're praying. Or with all this feeling for God, you're dressing modestly. So because the feelings in your heart, what's in your heart naturally pumps to the entire body, just as the heart is the pump of blood, giving oxygen, picking up carbon dioxide throughout the entire body the feelings of the heart pump through the body as well. So if you have a love in your heart, 
that love naturally expresses itself in your entire body. So if with love of God in your heart, you give charity, within the hand giving charity, there's love of God. With love of God in your heart, you're dressing modestly. As one dresses, there's love of God in my hands. There's love of God in my body. With love of God in my heart, I'm praying. As I'm praying, the love of God from my heart is in my throat, is in my lips, in my tongue, in my palate, in my larynx, in my teeth. And all those words are saturated with my love of God. That's natural. That's how it's supposed to be. Like we have the concept body language, right? If someone has a strong emotion, you see it written all over them. Well, how? Now, of course, some people don't, but most people can see it. What does this mean? means if there's a feeling in your heart that's very strong, it's expressed in your whole body. And your whole body resonates with that feeling. So this is a very powerful, useful concept in terms of our relationship with God. Because the love of God's in my heart, but my charity's in my fingers. So the love of God in my heart is separate from the charity in my fingers. No, it's not. Because that love extends to my whole body. So the hand giving charity is saturated with that love. Why do I need that hand giving charity to be saturated with the love? Because ultimately, a commandment is supposed to fly. Everything we do to serve God, we want it to ascend to God, as we spent several chapters learning here. And if it doesn't fly, it's earthbound. It's stuck here. And we're like, that's not the point. The point is for it to ascend. So what are the wings that allow my commandment or my Torah study to soar to God, my love and fear of him. So if I have this love and fear in my heart, and because it's in my heart, it's naturally pumping through my body. And therefore my fingers naturally feel this love and fear of my God, of God. And those fingers are now giving charity. Within the fingers giving charity is love and fear of God. So within that commandment, there's the wings, love and fear. And that commandment soars to God. How high does it soar? Well, based on the degree of love and fear. And so to every other commandment I do. If my whole body is feeling this love and fear of God and I'm visiting the sick, that's a commandment. That's like the body of the bird. But the love and fear in my body are like the wings that naturally are part of this commandment and allowing it to soar to God. What if the love and fear isn't in your heart? What if the love and fear is in your mind? Now I've got a problem. So here I have all this love and fear in my mind. And because I know it's the right thing to do, I give charity. And because I know I have a love of God and a fear of God, I give charity and I visit the sick and I make meals for people that need them. And I'm dressing modestly and I'm refraining from God. So I'm doing all the right things. And there is a love and fear inside of me, but it's not in my heart. It's in my mind. If it's in my mind, it's not extending to my body. We don't say the thoughts in the mind pump through the body. The thoughts in the mind are felt in the fingers and the toes. It's the feelings in the heart. So a person could have a good thought, literally a good positive thought in their mind of love and fear of God and motivated by that good thought, you could do the good deed and the two aren't joined. So the commandment doesn't have wings. So it can't go anywhere. Ah, uh, this is what our sages are saying. A good thought, God joins to the deed. That's literally the words. A good thought, God joins to the deed. Meaning you have a good thought, the love and fear, that's not exactly an emotion, but more in your brain. And you have the deed. You have the good deed, the commandment, done because of this love and fear. But the two are separate. So there's no wings. So this isn't going anywhere. A good thought, God joins to the deed, like surgically attaches. So all this love and fear, mental, intellectual, in your brain, that motivated this action are now attached to the action. Not naturally, naturally what's in your brain doesn't go into your fingers, but God attaches them. And now this commandment has wings and can soar. I just explained a lot because all of that was necessary to understand what the Rebbe is now saying. The Rebbe says it very cryptically because he explained all this to us in chapter 16. Chapter 16 was a while ago. What does this have to do with what we're saying here? I'm going to finish this and then I'll take questions because I know I just put a lot out there. The Rebbe is saying, 
I'm telling you, you have this love and fear of God. I'm telling you it's in your soul. It's embedded in your soul and it's real. And I'm telling you how you pull it out. If you talk about it to yourself or to anyone else, if you consciously think about it, if you do actions that will be in connaissance with this, expressive of it, keep doing it. Don't lose sight of the goal. Keep talking about it. Keep thinking about it. Keep doing it. It will allow this love to emerge. It will come out. It's a very powerful love. And then you'll naturally be expressing this, be serving God, doing the commandments, studying his Torah, saturated with this love, very intense love. Loving God is your life. Loving God is your father. You'd sacrifice anything for your parents. You'll sacrifice anything for God. And with this very strong love, that's very strongly felt in your heart because you focused yourself and you thought and spoke and did as per this love. And then those commandments are going to soar to God with this very powerful love. And if not, let's say you didn't finish the process. So you're aware of the love, you're talking about the love, you're thinking about the love, but you haven't yet pulled it out. You know it's true because you're a Jew and it's in your soul, but you're not feeling it yet. And you're doing the commandment because of this love that you don't feel yet. Well, that's a washout. I'm doing the commandment because of the love, but I don't feel the love. So therefore there's no feeling in the commandment. So therefore there's no wing. So therefore the commandment is earthbound. No, no, no. The Rebbe says, remember what I taught you in chapter 16? Same concept here. I mean, slightly different concept. There we were talking about a very specific intellectualized love and fear that couldn't get into the heart. Now we're talking something very different. We're talking about an innately very powerful love and fear that definitely can get into your heart, but hasn't gotten there yet. It hasn't emerged yet to the heart. You're still in the process. So don't get frustrated, the Rebbe is saying. Right now it's just in your brain. You're thinking the thoughts and talking the talk and doing the actions, but it's all in your brain. It's okay. You have all that in your brain. You have the good actions, the commandments coming as a result of all this good stuff in your brain. So it's not going anywhere. A good thought, God joins with a good deed. The awareness of the love and fear that you naturally have in your heart that you're not feeling it, motivated these commandments, God's gonna attach it. It will be the wings and the commandment will soar as high as this natural love. So don't worry, keep at it, keep doing it. Eventually, of course, in this situation, you are going to feel it in your heart because this is a very passionate love. You just haven't gotten there yet. But even before you get there, don't fear. Don't worry. All the commandments done because of it, God's going to join them. They're all going to soar. This is a reassurance. Now it takes 15 minutes to explain four words here, but this was a reassurance the Rebbe is saying. His bottom line reassurance is even if at this moment it feels fake. It feels mechanical. It feels not you. They're saying, don't worry. First, the Rebbe said, don't worry. It is you. It's inside of you. And the Rebbe is further saying, don't worry. Even if at this moment you still haven't gotten to the real feeling, what you're doing with this not really emotional awareness, God will make it work just like the emotional awareness. Stick with it. Stick with it. The commandments will soar. Stick with it, stick with it, you will have this feeling.